You are listening to ESG News and Views from the Conference Board. Congress just enacted one of the most significant workplace reforms in the last 50 years. The new law is a piece of bipartisan legislation that addresses the Me Too movement. It's called the Ending of Forced Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act. On March 30th, 2022, we recorded a webcast with Senator Kristen Gillibrand of New York, Congressman Ken Buck from Colorado, and New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and internationally recognized trailblazer for women's rights in the workplace, Gretchen Carlson. Our conversation focused on what the law does and what it means for business. And we also gave an insider's look at the legislative process and the compromises made along the way. And we got a sneak peek at what legislation may be coming out of Congress addressing workplace conditions in the future. We present that conversation for you now. Enjoy. Let's get underway. Gretchen, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. You know, this law marks the first major piece of federal legislation to come out of the Me Too movement. And it's a giant step forward in fostering a workplace culture that protects and uplifts victims of sexual harassment. Can you talk about those specifically, what this law does, what forced arbitration is and and how this law addresses it? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, Paul. It, uh, it's a complicated topic. And what I have found out since my lawsuit against Roger Ailes at Fox News five and a half years ago is that most people have no idea what it means. And that includes not only the millions of employees across the country, but also people who run companies, quite honestly. Um, when I talk to companies every single day, many times C-suite executives have to say to me, I need to check my contract. I have no idea. <laughs> and, and so this, uh, you know, for the most part, um, when we used to say forced arbitration, people would sort of have a glazed over look in their eyes. When I used to speak to thousands of people before COVID, I would say, raise your hand if you know whether or not you have a forced arbitration clause in your contract. And nobody would raise their hand. So this has been a huge educational journey for me. And, and what happened was that after my lawsuit, I started hearing from thousands of women around the country. I realized harassment was an epidemic. And then I realized forced arbitration to keep them quiet was an epidemic. So here's the problem in my mind with it. Um, it's a secret chamber. It was never the purpose of, of arbitration. It was supposed to be for small business disputes, not for human rights violations. Um, but unfortunately, over the last four decades, this has been used to cover up problems in the workplace. You don't get the same amount of witnesses or depositions. Um, there's no rule of law. The arbitrator is oftentimes picked by the company and they come back for repeat business. The arbitrator is usually not a jury of your peers because they tend to be retired judges and lawyers who, you know, let's be honest, are older white men who maybe are not a 25 year old African-American woman who may be coming before them. Um, and there are no appeals. So it is what it is, not to mention the fact that a very small percentage of the time does the employee actually win. And without the idea of being able to have it out in the open and with all of those things stacked against you from the beginning, the problem is we continue the vicious cycle of harassment and assault in the workplace because the perpetrator oftentimes gets to stay on the job because nobody knows about it. You can't warn other people. It's just what's promulgated this vicious cycle of the epidemic of harassment in the workplace. It's really interesting. So what you've talked about there is, is two impacts. One is on the individual, right? Because they may not get a fair shake in arbitration. The second is more systemic, which is because this is all done in arbitration and not in the courts, people aren't aware of what's going on. So this law has a double impact. Those who are most affected uh, on their individual uh, circumstances and then overall bringing something to light. And so I think that's it's really interesting in that regard. Um, Senator Gillibrand and, and Congressman Buck, and I'll call you Ken, thanks. Um, you know, you both played leading roles in the passage of this, um, of this new law. Um, can you tell me from your perspective, um, maybe Senator, if you'd begin, you know, what prompted the need for this legislation in your view and, and what caused you to take a leading role in it? So the reason why I got involved 
was um, because Gretchen asked me to get involved. Um, she <laughs> came to me and uh, shared her story about what had happened to her in general terms. And uh, I understood immediately how important this was for all workers. Um, I hadn't realized that most employment contracts have uh, mandatory arbitration clauses for cases of sexual harassment and sexual assault and and companion non-disclosure agreements. And the combination of those two things means that if you're being assaulted or harassed, you can't call out your perpetrator. You can't sue them in the court of law. You can't, you, you just can't get justice. And then when I looked into all the data about arbitration, an arbitration award typically is much smaller than a jury trial. I think the median sexual harassment settlement is $30,000 in arbitration, but it's $217,000 in court cases. We also know, as Gretchen said, that arbitration was never designed for this. It was designed for peer-on-peer uh, -peer litigation where companies were having to have a commercial dispute. It was cheaper and easier to go through arbitration, but they're equally balanced in terms of resources and in terms of access. And so that imbalance was created uh, when it was applied to these types of civil rights cases um, and issues of justice. And so, unfortunately, most people who had to go into these arbitration processes couldn't call out their uh, perpetrator. They couldn't warn their fellow workers. They couldn't change the climate at work because that perpetrator may never have been held accountable. And so it just perpetuated a system that was extremely harmful to workers. Um, especially if there was a predator at that workplace. And so we learned pretty quickly that if you vitiated these forced arbitration clauses, you would restore basic constitutional rights. When our law passed, it changed constitutional rights for 60 million people overnight. And that I think is gonna go a long way to allowing people to not only come forward, but to change the climate of their workplace and to get justice. And I'm very grateful for Gretchen's leadership. Um, I worked with Senator Lindsey Graham, who also uh, very much wanted to help when he heard Gretchen's story. And so together, we got together to get this bill done in the Senate. And then we had great, great partners in the House to do the same work. Great, thank you so much. And yes, part of what's happening here is changing a culture of silence too. Um, uh, around sexual harassment at, at companies and more broadly in society. Um, Ken, as a Republican from Colorado, um, can you tell me a little bit about your journey on this legislation? You know, why did you see it as important and, and what made you become one of the, the leading sponsors of it? Well, I was a prosecutor for 25 years and, and I uh, prosecuted rape cases. I uh, prosecuted domestic violence cases. I, I prosecuted uh, a lot of cases and supervised the prosecution of a lot of cases. Um, and really, uh, over that time, uh, I have a heart for victims. And, and uh, so often victims don't have a voice. And when I, I sat down with Gretchen, and, and talked about this bill, it just became uh, something that uh, impacted me in a way that uh, brought me back to those days when uh, I was uh, talking to, to victims of crime um, and not just uh, uh, sexual crimes, but uh, all crimes. And, and so often these, the, the folks who are in these jobs, uh, one, they need the income, two, uh, they uh, understand that if they uh, do something that is controversial in the workplace, it may affect their, um, uh, their future uh, employment, even if they leave that particular employer. Um, and, and three, uh, so often what I saw was uh, recidivism in, in the criminal world, where the same person is committing rapes, the same person is committing domestic violence, the same person is uh, in this long pattern of conduct. And so to leave a predator in the workplace is the absolute worst thing that, that we could possibly do. And this is, uh, this is really um, using a scalpel. As, as a conservative, I'm opposed to uh, the federal government developing one size fits all solutions in, in this country. But this was uh, uh, the use of a, of a scalpel to deal with a particular kind of cancer uh, that we could try to cut out of the workplace and 
uh, I join uh, the senator in, in uh, really congratulating uh, Gretchen Carlson on, on her courage and uh, perseverance. It, it, there, there were a lot of twists and turns in this legislation, but uh, when I saw Gretchen, I knew uh, that I was on the right side doing the right thing. Thanks so much. And yeah, it's, it's a, a scalpel approach, but very powerful one indeed, um, affecting the lives of 60 million people and, and then therefore more broadly in the workforce generally. Um, so you mentioned a bunch of twists and turns along the way. Um, so Ken, if you don't mind me, me asking, you know, other than Gretchen Carlson, <laughs> what were the key ingredients that made the passage of this legislation possible from your perspective? When you say key ingredients, the, the way the bill evolved, or uh, yeah, yeah, how did the bill of yeah, how did the bill evolve? What were the, the the factors that came into play in in making it possible to get this level of bipartisan support? Sure. So, so uh, from my perspective, the the last Congress, uh, the bill uh, was really defined as. Uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and sexual discrimination um, in, in the workplace. You couldn't have forced arbitration for those three categories. Um, I, I had a problem with sexual discrimination because I thought it was too broad. And so I didn't support the bill in the last Congress. So often what we deal with in, in Congress, and, and I think that you know uh, uh, the legislative process has been uh, compared to making sausage. And I think that's unfair to sausage makers, frankly. But I do think <laughs> that we are, uh, we, we do our best to, on some bills, try to reach a common uh, ground and, and move forward. So uh, sexual discrimination was dropped from, from this bill. Then uh, we had, there was a, a labor union uh, carve out that was in this bill. And that caused a lot of Republicans uh, to not join the bill. And it caused a lot of other Republicans, it gave them a talking point. Um, uh, and they were uh, really battering uh, Republicans in the House with that particular uh, clause. Uh, that was uh, taken out of the bill. And then finally, on the floor of the House, we introduced an amendment that had been uh, sort of run by the senators and run by uh, uh, both sides in, in the House uh, to change the definition of sexual harassment. And, and what we did was we said that each state has a definition of sexual harassment, and the, the bill should... Uh, just focus and, and allow the state definition to control as opposed to defining sexual harassment at the federal level and imposing that on the states. And I think that's really that that last amendment is what brought uh, more than 100 Republicans in the House on, on board. That's really interesting. So there was that federalism aspect that made it possible for more Republicans to, to join. Um, Senator, from your perspective, um, what was it here that that enabled this kind of um, this bipartisan dynamic to come together? It sounds like you needed to have you had Senator Graham, um, who could work with members of his own party. Um, you you were joined by others on your side of the aisle. But what were the key elements that helped make this um, this legislation possible from your perspective in the Senate? Um, from my perspective, I work on a bipartisan basis every day. And I had been working with Senator Graham for about five years before this on ending sexual assault uh, in the military. And we both served on the Armed Services Committee. And we really worked hard over many years trying to find common ground on how to reform how the military uh, dealt with this issue. And so we had a very good working relationship. When Gretchen approached us about um, employment contracts, it was something that Lindsay felt very comfortable doing. So he said, here you go, Kirsten, this is something I can agree with you on. So it was just a way for him to continue the work we've been doing in a much more difficult context. This was very easy common ground for us. And so once we paired up on this, getting a majority in the Senate was not difficult because both of us have a great deal of goodwill developed with our colleagues on understanding these constitutional issues and understanding the problems of sexual assault and sexual harassment. And we'd been working together for so long that people saw when we agreed that this must be really common ground. And so uh, that was necessary. And then second to that was 
um, getting Joni Ernst engaged. Um, she had some mm -hmm. uh, initial concerns that were dealt with with the amendment in the House. Um, same with Mike Lee. And so when those two senators felt we'd gotten the bill to the right place, they were able to sign off. That was absolutely necessary. And then last, um, it was important that, frankly, um, President Biden was the president because this is something he wanted done. And we had the majority in the House and Senate. So getting it on the floor was possible. This was not something that Senator McConnell ever put on the floor um, in the past five years that uh, Senator Graham and I had the bill. But because this was a presidential ambition, as well as having Senator Schumer in charge of the Senate, that strong relationship I have with Senator Schumer and the interest by the president was enough to get the vote. And so that's how we were able to get the vote in the Senate, which is pretty much the hardest thing on any bill. It's not bipartisanship. <laughs> I have a dozen bills that are bipartisan and ready to go. And so do all my colleagues or most of my colleagues. And so it's about time. Uh, the most precious commodity in the Senate is the time that you have a bill on the floor. And there's only so many bills that will ever get the benefit of a vote. And so Senator Schumer and I have such a good relationship that he made this a priority. Okay, that's, that's really helpful um, insight. So it's a combination, if you had a track record, right, and a reputation of working on bipartisan uh, legislation with Senator Graham, um, a willingness to compromise along the way and to address concerns. And then, yes, whether it's House rules or uh, the, the majority leader, being able to get it onto the floor is also key. And, and Senator, if I might follow up with you as well, um, there were also some concerns um, from folks in your party as the bill made its way through. How did, how did you address uh, objections that, oh, wait, this is too narrow now. It's not going as far as, as we hoped it would. So that was a real challenge uh, because we want to provide these protections for all workers, whether you're discriminated against because of your age or because you may have a disability or because of your race or your gender or your LGBTQ status. Those issues are just as important to all of us as uh, fighting for people who are harassed or discriminated against on the basis of uh, sexual harassment. Um, but we knew that one positive step forward is still worth doing and making sure that this class of employees could be protected was really meaningful. We also had a lot of data on this particular kind of harassment and discrimination. Uh, we had a lot of examples. You just had the Harvey Weinstein case. You'd had many allegations of other workplace sexual assault, sexual harassment for people to draw on. They knew it was a problem. They'd heard about it in their local papers. They'd heard about it on the national news. And so there's just more common ground because more people know about it. It also means that our work is not done. And so I spoke to Senator Graham at the White House bill signing and said to him, so how about any of these other areas? Are any of them areas that you'd like to now work on with me to protect workers? And so Senator Graham said, yes, and we are now working on ending um, age discrimination in the workplace. So that is the next bill we are going to introduce, and we will marshal all the evidence and data because there's a lot of data on age discrimination. Certainly in my state, I've heard about it from so many uh, constituents, especially once you hit 55. There's a lot of pushing out in favor of younger people because younger workers are less expensive. So um, I think that um, this will be the next piece that we tackle together, Senator Graham and I. Because uh, you do need to work on a bipartisan basis and you have to build from there. But eventually we'll protect all workers and I'm not going to give up until we do. Great. Thanks so much. And it's really interesting to hear that it was the data played such an important role here. Having the facts that everyone yeah. could agree on, on on the facts was key, as well as those high profile instances that drew public attention to this. Really, really interesting insights. Um, Ken, back over to you. So I, I, again, you talked about some changes that were made in the legislation that enabled you to get on board, but there were still some objections from, from folks and, on your side of the aisle. Could you talk a little bit about what, what remained as the sort of barriers why, for them, why they didn't feel comfortable signing on, do you think? Sure, I think one of the interesting differences between the House and the Senate is uh, nothing is unanimous in the House. And there are many things that are unanimous <laughs> in the Senate, fortunately, I guess. 
so there, there were really, uh, the, the Republicans who were opposed to this bill uh, felt like it was a slippery slope. That, that if we did away with uh, uh, arbitration in this area, um, it was really a, a way to start doing away with arbitration in, in all areas. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't agree with that. I, I, I think it's uh, one of those arguments that, that most people saw through. Frankly, um, I had a number of uh, House members come to me and, and tell me that after the debate on the floor, they were convinced to vote for this bill. And so I think they saw through that that argument uh, about uh, the uh, the slippery slope uh, of of ending forced arbitration in, in cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, on on the Democrat side, it was interesting, um, and and we really couldn't uh, argue too much about uh, how this wasn't uh, you know a slippery slope. How this was you know this was the last thing that we were going to do because on the progressive side in the House. They wanted more. They didn't want to pass yeah. this bill and hurt their chances of ending arbitration uh, agreements altogether, force arbitration uh, altogether. And so there was really a, a delicate balance of how do you uh, convince enough Republicans that this is not uh, the end of force arbitration and at the same time uh, get the progressives on the uh, Democrat side uh, uh, onto this bill. And so that was the, the balancing act that, that we had to deal with in the House. It's really interesting. So rhetoric can actually get in the way of results here. If, if when you tone it down and you focus on what the bill actually does, it might make it easier to, to reach consensus. Um, let me, I, I, Senator, I understand you've got to go off to do some votes very soon. So I'd like to, to have another question for, for all three of you, if I, if I might. You know, we know from our research at the conference board that, um, you know, there is a huge focus at the C-suite, the CEO level, um, among consumers um, and among employees, of course, on uh, economic issues and on workplace issues. The number one issue for CEOs in the United States and around the world is attracting and retaining talent. CEOs, again, their number one and two social issues are economic opportunity, and um, economic fairness. That beats out uh, all other social issues. Um, for consumers, their number one and number two sustainability issues, beating out environmental concerns, are actually fair labor and fair working conditions. Really interesting, like bipartisan, all levels of a company care about economic opportunity, economic fairness, and workplace um, you know, fair labor conditions and fair wages. So I, I'm wondering whether, apart from the, the, the idea of maybe tackling age discrimination, are there other areas that you see as possible for, uh, for bipartisan collaboration to, to address this, this real focus on, on uh, workplace, uh, workplace fairness? and uh, an opportunity. Um, Senator, I'll start with you, and then Ken, I'd like to hear your views as well as your views, Gretchen. So um, in terms of workplace fairness, uh, some of the other areas that I work on include um, equal pay for equal work, just making sure there's an encouragement for employers to have more transparency, um, simply just listing what jobs you have and what the general pay is for those jobs, and then doing your own assessment, like. If I have a male and a female doing the same job, are they being paid the same? So really encouraging transparency, um, encouraging the ability for employers to ask uh, if other people in their same job are re receiving the same pay, pay. And so we have legislation to do that. Um, there's also workplace fairness issues around um, the care economy, meaning that despite all other things, women are still doing something like 70% of the care and household chores in any given family. So it's very hard to have the responsibilities you have at work and all the responsibilities at home or the vast majority of the responsibilities at home. And so increasing structural support for work, meaning a national paid leave plan, affordable daycare, universal pre-K, those three things alone would make it easier for parents to thrive in the workplace 
uh, to make sure single parents can thrive in the workplace, to make sure that the caregivers and families who are often women can thrive in the workplace. And so those are some fairness and equity issues that I'm also working on uh, because we want everyone to thrive. We want everyone to be working at their fullest economic potential. When all workers are working for their highest pay in their most senior job they can get, you have a faster growing economy and you have more prosperity in America. So these investments would make a, a huge difference in creating economic growth immediately. Great. And can I ask you, do you think there's much um, uh, prospect for bipartisan support in, in the Senate for for some of these? Or where do you think the, the likelihood of bipartisan yes. support is greatest? So the affordable daycare um, idea, there's lots of bipartisan ideas about how to get there with tax credits, tax deductions. Um, for national paid leave, again, there's bipartisan support on the tax benefit side, not necessarily on making it an earned universal benefit yet, but that's what I'm working towards. And um, universal pre-K, I think there's potential bipartisan support with just grants to states that create this kind of support. So uh, there's always a place for bipartisanship. There's always a piece of every idea that can find common ground, and that's what I'm working towards. Great, thanks. Um, and can you know, come from a different side of the aisle, a different part of the country, um, and you know, I, understanding your concerns about federalism and expanding role of federal government, are, are there areas where you think the two parties can come together to uh, to improve economic opportunity, uh, workplace conditions, and um, and and so forth? I think there are. I. I, I, I... Uh, am somewhat reluctant to to go uh, in some of the areas that, that uh, the senator mentioned, sure. but I do think sure. that um, when we talk about uh, improving our economy, we're talking about improving our economy for for everyone. And, and uh, what we saw in, in the last few years, uh, or actually a few years ago, uh, with uh, tax cuts, were uh, an improved economy, a business economy that really helped a lot of people. I think one of the things we have to focus on uh, is competition in the workplace, making sure that uh, there are employers who are competing for employees and are willing to give benefits to employees because they want to retain employees or, uh, frankly, they want to attract uh, employees from other companies. And so um, I have a much uh, uh, greater um, comfort in the private sector dealing with a lot of the issues that we see around fairness and around uh, equity and, and how do we uh, really improve the, uh, the working conditions. And, and in my mind, uh, having the, the federal government or, or state government uh, interfere is, is dangerous because oftentimes we have unintended consequences that uh, set us back as opposed to move us forward. So I, I think that um, uh, from my perspective, uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, uh, competition and and, um, in, in, and also I think one of the great things that, that Gretchen Carlson did, frankly, was to uh, bring awareness uh, uh, to certain issues. I when when she mentions that you know she would go and talk to groups and ask them to raise their hands if they uh, knew whether they had a, a forced arbitration agreement or not, and no one raised their hands. Um, when we talk about the need for uh, affordable uh, daycare um, in my district, I, I went last uh, August to probably 15 different towns that had less than three, 4,000 people in them. And getting affordable daycare in rural America is an even more is even more of a challenge than, than in uh, urban America. And so uh, there, they, those, those uh, challenges, I think, can be, uh, solved um, in a, at least in a partnership between uh, the private sector and, and government. But uh, I, we all want that to sounds get like some good point. bipartisan basis to work on. I'm, I'm going to follow up it. on affordable daycare because in <laughs> rural New York, right. it's really hard. There's one slot for every eight kids that need it right now. So we definitely yeah, want to find ways to make more availability. 
Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Uh, uh, the gavel. Yep. It's it, the it's approved. All right. <laughs> so we. I, I clerked at the Supreme Court, and the joke was that when Justice O'Connor voted, the whole thing was decided. Anyway, so uh, you get a couple of people together, it, it works. No, I think that's it's really interesting because it is something that crosses the on these economic issues. We, it crosses the red blue divide. It crosses the divide um, between rural areas and, and urban areas. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for folks to come together here. Um, so, uh, so Gretchen, your thoughts on what's next on the horizon. And thank you, Senator. Um, so at my organization, Lift Our Voices, uh, we are laser focused on eradicating the two silencing mechanisms in the workplace. So arbitration, which we've been talking about, and then also NDAs, which are the other culprit of keeping these issues silent and promulgating throughout decades and decades. Um, so we believe that those are the silver bullets to equity. So now that we've accomplished forced arbitration just for harassment and assault, and I happen to agree with the Senator that we need to protect um, other, other groups who are disenfranchised as well from that. But um, getting to NDAs is incredibly important. And uh, the Congressman and I just had a conversation about that yesterday, as well as with the Senator. Um, because we, we believe that that's a, a huge other way that companies you know silence, silence their people and it's kind of an old school way of looking at it. So we believe that actually our issues are the silver bullets to equity for everything because if silence is a key marker inside of your company, then maybe you also don't agree with paying your people fairly and lifting them up and retaining them because everything else is silent. Um, so that's my first point. The other thing about pushing out talent, um, and that is such a, a high important concern for all C-suite executives, that's exactly what happens with NDAs and forced arbitration. You push out women, you push out people of color, you push out diversity, and you may not even realize that you're doing it, not because you're naive, but I've had many conversations with CEOs where they've actually looked at their general counsel in the room and they said, do we have these things? And the general counsel will say, yep. And on one occasion in Chicago, the CEO said, not anymore. They're going away today. Because he did not understand that he was pushing out the exact people he wanted to retain. And especially in an employee market right now, where employees have more choice, um, we, we believe that these things are incredibly important. The last thing I would just add is that you talk about the studies at the conference board, a, a, a study that we did at Lift Our Voices with a partner organization found that the number one issue amongst men and women about workplace issues now in 2021, for the first time ever, it was not equal pay. That was number two. Number one was eradicating misogyny, harassment, assault, and silence in the workplace, unbelievably. So we have come a long way in the last five years to educate people about these issues. It's really interesting. And you know, uh, Ken, it also seems to me that you were talking about competition for, for workers. Um, and it sounds like there's another potential area for common ground here. And look, I'm not advocating, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, not advocating for any legislation here, obviously. But it does sound like there's common ground around the idea of transparency. Um, to, to enable the, 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 uh, the labor market to work more efficiently. So that's not necessarily telling companies what they need to do, but increasing some degree of transparency. I don't know if you've got thoughts on, on that idea. Oh, I, I think uh, absolutely. And I've had uh, great conversations with Gretchen. One of the challenges on the, on the federal system, again, is to see um, how things work. Oftentimes we look at states and we see uh, a law that's passed in the state and uh, what the impacts are. And, and, and frankly, the state will come back a year or two later and, and amend the law and, and, and fix some of the, uh, the issues. And so before we uh, end up doing something on a national level, we, we learn from and even uh, one of the great things that occurred here with, with Gretchen's work was that uh, some of these uh, major American companies did away with the uh, forced arbitration before Congress ever acted um, and before many of the states acted. And so uh, there are uh, corporate players who recognize the benefits of uh, doing the right thing. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I am reluctant to use federal power 
um, before I know uh, what the result's going to be. And I, and I think that we uh, uh, and, and, and various people um, in, in the Senate and House are um, at, at various different places on that. Some want to lead and um, uh, hopefully the states and, and corporate America follow. And, and some of us want to be a little more uh, careful, uh, especially in this area, of, of uh, how we move forward. And so I think that uh, as, as Gretchen and I and others work through these non-disclosure, non-disclosure agreements and uh, some of the other areas, uh, it, it's really a challenge. I do look forward to working with Senator Gillibrand on uh, daycare. I think it is a huge issue uh, in America. And so yeah. um, I think it's really uh, exciting um, to, to be able to, to learn more uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, find some good solutions. Well, that, that, that's great. Um, and I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see this, this happen in, in, in real time like this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as, as you talked about, um, can the, you know, states are sort of laboratories of democracy. You've got the private sector and the front lines of working through a lot of these issues, and you can see some private sector ordering on them. Um, I'm wondering what your advice is to CEOs today in, in the wake of the passage of this law. You know, how would you talk to them about what they ought to be doing with their with their workforce, with questions of, you know, workplace fairness and all? What, what you know, you've, you're in a room with a bunch of CEOs. What's, what's your advice to them? Well, it's rare that I'm in a room with a bunch of CEOs, but if it happens. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you are virtually you. right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, one of the things I've been working on are uh, antitrust laws uh, in, in relation to big tech. And, and I have had mm-hmm. a lot of interaction with CEOs and uh, counsel uh, for various uh, companies. And, and I think that... Uh, I don't know that that CEOs really understand the impact they have on uh, members of Congress when they come in, uh, door closed, no notes being taken, nothing's recorded, and just honestly say, you know, we've got an issue and and, uh, we're looking for some help in solving this issue. And uh, that honesty, uh, it really has an impact on uh, members in the House and, and senators and uh, so I would I would say get involved, you know, get off yeah. the couch, uh, just like I tell voters. And, and I don't care if you vote for me or you vote for somebody else, but make sure you vote. And, and the same thing with with uh, CEOs. If, if, if there is an issue, uh, whether it's with competition in the antitrust area, whether it's with uh, labor issues, um, whether it's with immigration, frankly, it's another issue that I work with, uh, work on in, in judiciary. Um, get off the couch, uh, get to the hill, come see. 10, 12 members in a day. Uh, and I know everybody's busy. I'm not suggesting that, that uh, you, know, you should uh, avoid your government affairs uh, vice president at all. But, but it, coming from a CEO, it's a lot more uh, powerful, genuine, and uh, I think uh, taken more seriously. And so I would, I would encourage people to, to get involved. That's, that's really excellent advice. And I, I just note that Companies, in some ways, are, are feeling a little shell, shell shocked. We've we did a, a, a survey and found out um, that actually um, about eighty percent of uh, corporations felt like twenty twenty two was going to be as challenging an environment for corporate political activity as twenty twenty one was, and that was both on the political contribution side and on the. Uh, and on the public advocacy lobby side. But what you're saying is don't be shy, come forward and bring your CEO to talk about the issues that really matter so you can have that transparent, candid conversation that actually, frankly, also builds an environment of trust going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, no, really, really helpful. Um, Kristen, I'd like to turn to you too to ask you um, about about the journey here. I mean, this this legislation was percolating for a while. Um, it represented a broad grassroots movement. And I, can you talk, we've talked a bit about the legislative process, but I'd actually like to wind back the clock a little bit and talk about the grassroots movement here and how that led to the um, to the legislation that, that was passed uh, in February and signed into law in March. 
Yeah, um, because we had this massive victory, it, it makes it seem like, you know, poof, this is great. Right. You just really easily <laughs> in a bipartisan bill. Um, this has been an arduous journey for the last um, five years for me. Uh, I would, you know, sometimes I call it a slog. Um, but luckily, <laughs> I, I grew up in the great state of Minnesota where my parents instilled in me the Protestant work ethic, and I've killed myself to, to basically try to, to, to get this done with the help of the two people on this call today. Um, who were champions of it. But um, I could write a book on how to pass a bill now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, really it was just, it was walking the halls of Congress. You know, I started um, five years ago and mainly my strategy was to get to Republican because this tends to be more of a democratic issue. And um, so so that was my goal. Um, and being able to flip somebody like, like Ken, who originally didn't agree with this legislation and then we made slight tweaks and then he did was, you know, a really great experience for me. And we've developed a friendship over that. And that's what happened with other members of Congress as well. Um, in the Senate, we all know it's 50-50. So I needed to have 10 Republicans on board. And even though you mentioned it was unanimous consent, there was a ton of stuff in the weeds <laughs> that people don't know about. I had to get 10 Republicans to get to that point. Um, and so that was, uh, my kids and I actually would have a happy dance in the kitchen every time I got another one. Um, we actually had a board up in our kitchen uh, where we were marking off till we got to, to 10. So at first we got five on, on judiciary in the Senate. So we had Graham and Grassley and Kennedy and Blackburn and Hawley. And if you think about their politics, even inside of the, the Republican party, they're very different. So very conservative to more moderate. Um, so it was interesting how they came together on this issue. And then I got uh, outside of judiciary, I got uh, Portman, Collins, Murkowski, um, oh, also on judiciary, Tillis, and then Shelley Moore Capita. Um, and that, you know, when I got 10, that was a, a crying day of joy because I knew that it would pass. And as the Senator mentioned, the next hurdle was, how the hell do we get this thing to the floor? Because it was such a small, narrow bill, you know, how do we get the attention of Schumer um, to be able to, you know, do we need to attach it to something um, that's bigger? Do we, you know, is there a way we can get it? And it, it became that, you know, Schumer said it was one of his top 10 priorities to get to get to the floor. Um, and so, you know, it was almost like the perfect storm. It, uh, the House actually acted first. And uh, in February, um, I was there for it. Um, we, uh, I had 20 firm Republicans and we got 113, thanks in part very much to Ken, who's on this call, um, who really whipped them up. Um, and then that sent a big message to the Senate. And three days later, uh, the Senate has a different format of how they did it, but it was unanimous consent. I was also there for that. And then I cried uh, tears of joy. And then three weeks later, um, we were at the White House to to sign this into law. And I spoke and introduced the president. And uh, after he signed it, he gave me this pen. <laughs> so um, this is, you know, something that's going to remain really important to me. And this is not about Gretchen Carlson. This is about the millions of people that I have helped um, because I happen to have the platform to be able to get this done and the perseverance. Um, and I encourage, um, as, as Ken said, I encourage you to call your members of Congress. And I also encourage every CEO and C-suite or HR executive on this call to reach out to me because I want to help you through this process. You can go to my website at GretchenCarlson.com or at liftourvoices.org. I want to help you get on the right side of history on this and do what's right for your employees. Because this is how we solve these issues. It's by talking about them. And I think that in the beginning when I started this fight, companies felt like maybe it was just a passing fad and they didn't really have to address it. And I actually noticed this major tonal shift the second time we brought the bill around where I would ask people, raise your hand if you're in favor of keeping women and men who are assaulted and harassed in the workplace silent. Oh, I don't see any hands. Okay, so now we have a good starting point, and this is how we get it done. Um, so I encourage all companies to do what's right now because the queen has left the station, and you're gonna be left in the dust with this particular issue. And people are going to leave your companies if you continue to silence them. Um, so call me up, get on the right side of the history, um, and, and I will help you through this process. Thanks very much, and um, thanks for all of your 
remarkable work on this and for sharing the insights of, of what it took to, to get this done. I think one thing that's also struck me about this discussion is that one thing that might have made some of this possible was that this was not a high profile issue on which there was polarization beforehand, right? I mean, it was, you brought something to light that people could look at in light of data and so forth, and they hadn't, they, they weren't necessarily entrenched. And I think that's also something for, for folks who are thinking about problems that need to be solved, <clears throat> you know, speak up because as Congressman, as Ken, you said, you know, come forward with these issues that people may not know about. Um, but where 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 Congress might 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 be able to help, um, and it, that seems to be an interesting dynamic here as well. So let me just conclude, if I could, with any any final words of advice that each of you e each of you might have um, for anyone who's seeking to get legislation through this year. <laughs> In a in a midterm, is it is it just wait for twenty twenty three, or is you know what should you be doing to be doing now if you've if you've got one of these issues if you're at a company and you say you know whether it's relating to tech or antitrust you know there's a whole litany of of topics that are out there that that companies would like to see action on can what should they do do they just hold their breath and wait for twenty three or what do they do now. No, I think uh, one of the lessons that I think uh, Gretchen uh, learned and, and shared uh, before is is that uh, this is a five year process. You you've got to yeah. you've got to start a bill. You've got to start with an idea. You've got to start with a, a a small group of people that feel passionately um, inside uh, these buildings, and and then it, it starts to percolate. And um, as other people learn the issue better, uh, they start to join, and and you gain this. Uh, critical mass at some point, but you, you don't uh, you don't come to Congress. Our our government wasn't set up to move quickly, and and thank right. God it wasn't because we yeah. would have and your business executives would be really mad if we didn't move <laughs> quickly because uh, there would be no uh, predictability in in what we were doing, and and that's really important for uh, the business world, the corporate world, and 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 also for for the country, and so. Uh, uh, as as we start to talk about the next set of issues in, in uh, the labor area, the corporate area, the antitrust area, the immigration area, uh, it takes a while to, to get people uh, to, to come together. One of the things I think that's really amazing is that, that people will do, uh, in, instead of uh, taking a poll and figuring out whether the people in my district agree with me, um, I'll actually lead on an issue and then go and try to make sure that I am uh, talking and explaining why I did what I did. And and that takes time. And so um, we convince uh, the leaders in this uh, body that they need to move forward on an issue. Then it's up to the leaders to go back to their uh, to their districts, to their states and and talk about the issue. So you you help build a critical mass in the country. That's how our government works. It's how it worked in, in this uh, particular legislation. And it's how it will work in the future. That's really important. So people need to think when they're interacting um, with with policymakers that you're not just trying to get their vote. You actually want they need to become ambassadors for you on the topic so that they can go back and, and explain their votes to others who, who may need a bit of convincing. So I think that's that's a really critical point. Um, Gretchen, you've you've earned your stripes here on this this bill. Any any advice to others on on getting legislation through in the future? Um, already working on it. Uh, you got to strike when the iron's hot. Um, as I said, I, I met with Ken in person yesterday. Uh, I met with Senator Gillibrand in person uh, and many others yesterday uh, Ashley, and spoke at the National Press Club. I mean, it's, it's all about getting educational information out there for people. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we are immediately moving forward in these other areas, whether it's NDAs or arbitration for other issues, as the senator mentioned, with regard to age discrimination, where we think we might be able to find um, the next uh, era of bipartisan support. And no, I'm not waiting for 2023 um, because, you know, we I believe that we can maybe get one more of these issues accomplished uh, before the midterms uh, when people still like each other right now. <laughs> and um, so, so, you know, I continue to, to press forward. I kind of, I know how 
it works a little bit now. So um, I, I have a lot more information than I did at the at the beginning. And um, it's it's true. It's it's finding the ambassadors who want to champion the cause because they're the ones that are going to do the work. And then my last piece of advice would be that you just never know who you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like that. I think I was going to get uh, Congressman Matt Gates. Did I think I was going to get Senator Josh Hawley, Senator Marsha Blackburn? No. But, you know, a vote is a vote is a vote is a vote. And you never know what they're going to think about the issue. Um, and and I'm grateful to you know anyone who voted uh, for this and and saw it the right way. Well, thanks. Thank you both so much for being part of this discussion. You know, the conference board focuses on being a place for open minded civil discussion in a safe and constructive environment. And and this webcast has been the best example of that. So thank you. Thank you both for all you've done on this issue and frankly, for for all you've done with for our audience today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Stay safe and be well. This has been ESG News and Views from the Conference Board.